Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at the beginning of the chapter on energy, work, heat, and power. So when you think of energy, what are the kinds of things you think of? Um, well, first of all, we have the sun that gives us basically all of the energy on earth for life. The sun uh, gives uh, the plants the ability to um, convert uh, it, you know, the things that they're absorbing with the chlorophyll into sugar so that they can grow. Uh, animals eat plants. Uh, we eat plants and animals. Therefore, all of that energy from the sun coming through the plants is basically coming into us and giving us the energy we need to survive. And pretty much all life on Earth uh, behaves this way. There have been life forms that have been discovered recently that don't necessarily need the sun, um, usually near the uh, volcanic vents in the bottom of the ocean but most of the life on Earth requires the sun to survive. So energy is basically defined as the capacity to do work. So what are the different forms of energy? Well, there's d several different forms of energy. Uh, I have a list of them here. Um, thermal energy, electrical energy, radiant energy, nuclear, gravitational, kinetic, elastic potential, sound, chemical potential. Some of these you probably already know about. Uh, others you might not be so sure. Um, we will be discussing a few of them in this chapter. Quick little note, heat is actually not a form of energy. The word heat actually means the transfer of energy from a warmer body to a cooler one. So uh, heat is almost a verb more than a noun uh, because it, it requires this transfer of energy. It deals with energy, it talks about energy, but it specifically talks about the transfer. When we talk about um, like temperature energy, that's usually called thermal energy. So one of the biggest laws, which is the law of conservation of energy, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, it, sorry, let me start that over again. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form or uh, to another. So this is actually a law. the law of conservation of energy. It's a universal law. You can't create energy out of nothing, uh, so you can only talk about what are the transformations that energy is uh, partaking in. So for an example here, we have a microwave oven. Uh, the microwave oven takes electrical energy, turns it into microwaves, Microwaves represent radiant energy. Radiant energy is uh, any kind of energy that is transmitted by waves. So microwaves, infrared radiation, um, actual nuclear radiation, uh, any type of wave-based energy is radiant energy. And after it turns it into radiant energy to warm up the food, it turns it into thermal energy. Again, doesn't turn it into heat. Uh, it turns it into thermal energy. Um, so heat is another one of those words, kind of like weight, that people tend to use um, in the wrong context. So we got to be a little bit careful there. I myself might make that mistake as I talk about that in a later chapter. So if energy is the capacity to do work, it's kind of important to understand what work is. So work is the energy transferred to an object by an applied force over a measured distance. So we look at the equation for work, and work is equal to the force times the displacement. Now, this is where we have two vectors multiplying. Uh, I've been talking about this quite a bit in class as to, you know, explaining how do you deal with two vectors multiplying. Um, and I've been kind of putting it off to the side up until this point, but now we're gonna discuss it a little bit. Uh, there's actually two different ways of multiplying vectors. There's a dot product and there's a cross product. We're dealing with a dot product here and you can clearly see the dot between the F and the D right there. So the, the, the problem is that vectors can have different directions. So how do you take into consideration that change in direction or that difference in direction if you have two vectors multiplying and you do have to talk about it? 
So I'm going to use work as the way to represent that. But before we get to that, I just want to give a very simple example of uh, how you would deal with this equation. So let's say I asked you how much work does it take to uh, lift a, um, let's say, 20 kilogram box uh, from the ground to a height of let's say uh, one meter. Let's say 1.2 meters, just to make it a little bit off uh, so that the numbers don't look pretty. Sometimes it's better to do that so it doesn't look like it's always gonna give really nice numbers. So how much work does it take to lift a 20 kilogram box from the ground? So we know that work is equal to the multiplication of the force vector times the displacement vector. And if we draw a quick little um, system diagram here, uh, let's say this is our box on the ground right? We're going to lift that box up one meter high. Uh, sorry, 1.2 meters high above the ground. And that's going to be our displacement. Uh, sorry, I'm just using D for displacement here. You can use delta D. We used to use delta D, um, but since our initial, dis our initial position is zero, which would be, we would consider to be the, the surface of the earth, uh, D2 minus D1 is just 1.2 here, so it's easier to just use D. Um, so we're going to use this equation. Now, in this particular case, the force that we're exerting to lift the box and the displacement are both in the same direction. So the um, it, it really just becomes, in this case, a multiplication of the two. Now, as a little bit of a seed to plant in your head, the angle between these two, if they're in the same direction, is zero degrees, okay? So angle between vectors is zero degrees. So we're gonna have to take into consideration the angle between the two, but you're gonna see, and you'll see why in a minute, but because the angle is zero degrees between the two, meaning the force and the displacement are perfectly in the same direction, we literally just put those two values right into the equation. So what is the force acting on the box that we're acting against to lift it? Um, so if you think about our free body diagrams from the past, what is the only force pulling down on the object here? It's the force of gravity. So that's the only force that we're acting against. And we're going to say that we're moving this object, so our applied force is going to be upwards here. We're going to say that we're moving this object without any acceleration. Okay, so uh, and in fact it actually doesn't matter whether there's an acceleration or not. Um, all that matters is really the initial position and the final position, but just to keep things um, you know copacetic with what we've seen before, uh, let's just say that there's no acceleration on this box so that we don't have to deal with that. And um, we are, uh, we are going to add these two forces, so Fa plus Fg, which is our net force. And because there's no acceleration, this is equal to Ma, but Ma in this case is zero, because the acceleration is zero. And that means our applied force is equal to the negative of the force of gravity. So our applied force is the negative of Mag, and we do have to use vectors here, so Ag will be negative 9.8. Okay, uh, and it's a dot product with the uh, displacement, and the displacement in this case is 1.2 meters. So what we end up with is, uh, and I've forgotten the mass of the box, 20 kilogram box times negative 9.8 times 1.2. And that's gonna give us a positive answer here. I'll just pull up my calculator. Oops.
So the negatives cancel out, so we have 20 times 9.8 times 1.2, and that's going to equal 235.2, and the answer for work, the unit, is in joules, because work is the capacity, uh, sorry, energy is the capacity to do work, energy is measured in joules, work is also measured in joules, so 235.2 joules of work, okay? So how does this angle come into play? Well, to start us off, uh, I just want to mention what is the true equation for work? So as I stated, this is the equation for work. This is called the dot product. Well, when you actually multiply two vectors with the dot product, what you do is you take the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector and you multiply that by cosine of theta. And you're going to say, where does that cosine theta come from? Well, I'm going to explain that in a second, but I just want to talk about the fact that if theta was zero degrees, which we said was the angle between these two vectors, what is cosine of zero? So the cosine of zero, if you do that on a calculator, sorry, I made that theta by accident, the cosine of zero is equal to one. So in this example up here, cosine of zero is just one, so it disappears, and you're left with just mag times 1.2, okay? So why do we need this angle? Why do we need that cosine theta in this equation? Well, let's take a look at an example where the forces aren't, the force is not in the same direction as the displacement, such as this one here. So only the component of the force in the direction of the displacement does the work. So if we look at this person pulling on the suitcase here, the person's pulling at an angle, right? But the suitcase is rolling forwards. So technically speaking, the person is not pulling on the suitcase with the most efficient direction to maximize the amount of work that they're doing on the suitcase. If they wanted to do that, they should be pulling the suitcase perfectly horizontal because that's the direction the suitcase is moving in. It's just because it's more comfortable on a human being to stand up while you're walking, so we pull it at an angle. Well, that means that you're not really using all the force to its best effect. And I'm going to try to show this with this picture over here. If you look at this picture, first of all, you can now see the angle between the force and the displacement that I was talking about a little bit clearer. Like when, when it's zero, I'm actually going to draw that a little bit better so it doesn't look like a full circle there. Okay, so this is the angle theta between those two, um, the force and the displacement. But if you take a look at the components of the force, the component that's here, let's call it Fx, the f component of force that's in the x direction is only this little piece right here. And we find that by drawing a right angle triangle down to find both the X and the Y component of that force. And the, 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 the best component of force is FX. That's the one that's pulling the suitcase forward. The rest, the vertical component of force is actually, and we'll see this in grade 12, uh, is actually helping to, to just make sure the suitcase doesn't fall through the ground, which is kind of silly to say, but it, it's, it's actually affecting the normal force on the ground. It's making it easier for the ground to support the suitcase. But that's not pulling the suitcase forward. The only component of the force that's pulling the suitcase forward is Fx. Well, if I write the equation for Fx, if we think of trigonometry, theta is here. Which side is Fx to theta in a right angle triangle? Isn't that the adjacent side? Isn't the force the hypotenuse? So can we not say that cosine theta is equal to the adjacent side, which is fx, divided by f? And I'm going to drop the um, vector symbol here because we're just talking about the magnitude of the size of f. We're not talking about the direction at this moment. Cosine theta, when you're trying to find um, a trigonometric scenario, you don't use vectors. You just use magnitudes of, of, size, of sides. Okay. 
Well, let's rearrange for fx. Doesn't fx become f cosine theta? So in this question, when I would, if I was to ask you uh, to calculate the amount of work done, okay, we would write w is equal to f vector times d vector. But because it's a dot product, we have to say, well, what force is actually the one that's pointing in the direction of the displacement? Well, we would replace f by fx times d. And now we're talking about two things that are pointing in the same direction. But fx is f cos theta times d. So the f cos theta is the component of the force that's pointing in the direction of the displacement. And all of those things have to be pointing um, like, sorry, I, I, I got to be careful here because there is going to be a case where they're not pointing in exactly the same direction, but you'll understand that case when I get to it. Um, they have to be like all horizontal is what I'm saying. Okay. If the displacement is horizontal, the force also has to be horizontal. Well, Fx is my horizontal force. That's F cos theta. And if we um, write that in a slightly different way, F D cos theta, and that's where this cos theta on the previous slide comes from. Okay, so the magnitude of f with the vector is just f, the magnitude of the d with the vector is just d, and then you've got your cos theta that comes into play there. Now, a lot of textbooks will nowadays leave it in this form, simply because it's to help students understand that the f cos theta is the component of force that's pointing in the direction of the, or horizontally with the displacement, and if you want to, you can write it like this. I have seen textbooks write it like this as well. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Um, for the most part, often the force is already in the direction of the displacement. We will deal with some that aren't, but for here, if we look at this example, an airport terminal employee is pushing a line of carts with a force of 95 newtons. How much work is done if the carts move 16 minute meters in the direction of the force? So here they're telling us that the force and the displacement are in the same direction. So if we write the equation for work, we always start with the original equation. So it's F dot D, so this is the dot product. We call it F dot D when you have two vectors. The force is 95 newtons, but that's 95 cosine theta. But the thing here is theta is equal to zero degrees because they're both in the same direction. Oftentimes what students will do once they get used to this concept is they'll say, well, I know they're both in the same direction. So I'm just going to drop the cosine zero because I know that answer is just going to be one anyway, but I want to show you all the work here. Uh, the final unit, uh, is going to be in joules. So we've got 95 times 1 times 16. So basically 95 times 16, which I will use my calculator to calculate here. And that equals 1,520 joules of work. Okay, so they, these can be very simple calculations. Let's take a look at the next one. Now in this case, calculate the work on the vacuum cleaner when moved 30 meters to the right. Oh, sorry, that's supposed to be three meters to the right, not 30. Let me change that right now. Okay, now take a look at this scenario. The force is 50 Newtons in this direction the displacement is in this direction. They are not in the same direction. Okay. So we're going to have to um, deal with that with the cos theta. So again, work is equal to F dot D. What is the force? Well, the force is 50 Newtons times cosine theta. 
right and the theta here is 30 degrees so we can just change that to 30 and that's multiplied by the displacement which is 3 meters actually I keep making the mistake of putting I don't like putting the units in the full equation uh, until the very end and we know that the units are going to be joules anyway so you would use a calculator so 50 times now this calculator I have to do some jumping around to get the trigono trigonometry to work so it changed it to 50 times cosine theta times 3 and that's equal to 129.9 or let's just round that off to 130 joules So once again, these are the two vectors for force and displacement. We've got 30 degrees between them. You're drawing a right angle triangle to find out what is the component of the force that is in the same direction as the displacement. And it's that component that we're interested in, but that component is F times cosine 30. So that's why you need the cosine 30 because you're multiplying two vectors that are potentially not in the same direction. You can have positive work or you can have negative work. And this is what I was explaining earlier when I said, as long as the force and the displacement are horizontal to each other, they don't have to be pointing in the same direction because you can actually have the force pointing completely backwards with respect to the displacement and still have work. So what is happening in a case like that? Well, positive work is when the force is in the same direction as the displacement, and that would be theta is equal to zero degrees, um, or anything between 90 and zero degrees, so zero and 90 degrees is positive work. Negative work is when the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement. So we're usually gonna be talking about forces that are directly opposite the displacement. So let's say your displacement is this way and your force is that way. Well, what is the angle between the two vectors? It's 180 degrees. One of the forces that does this is friction. Okay, friction is always going to do negative work on an object. So uh, if you say something like, as an example, um, an object moves three meters, um, under the influence of a force of friction uh, let's say of 10 newtons what is the work done on the object Okay, so in this case, the uh, thing that's doing the work would be like, let's say the floor, right? The floor is exerting friction on the object, which eventually would slow it down, but we're not worried about the slowing down effect. We're just worrying about what is the work done by the floor to stop this object uh, or to slow this object down. So um, if we draw a picture of our free body diagram, our displacement, let's say is three meters in this direction, our force of friction uh, is going to be in this direction. Okay. Uh, actually, I got to be careful here. There's actually no, not, there's not necessarily a force pushing it forward. We don't know that. So this is, this is a scenario where you got to be careful because this arrow is representing a force, but this is actually a displacement. So it's actually probably better to do this to show the displacement of three meters. Okay. Um, there's only one force acting on the box from what we can tell in the question, which is the force of friction. So what is the work done? Well, the work is equal to force dot displacement. The force is 10 newtons, but in a direction that's 180 degrees from the direction of motion, 
our displacement is three meters. What is the cosine of 180? Well, if you do that on a calculator, the cosine of 180 is negative one. And this is gonna give us a negative 30 joules of work. And the negative means that the amount of work is done in the opposite direction to the displacement. So that's what this was saying, that you can have positive work um, and you'll, you'll get positive work anywhere between, the, the most efficient one is at zero degrees, but between zero and 90 degrees, you will get positive work. Uh, anything past 90 degrees is gonna give you negative work. We normally in grade 11 only deal with work uh, that's negative if it's completely in the opposite direction of the motion, uh, which is the most common, which is friction. Let's look at another example. So a toboggan carrying a child, total mass of 85 kilograms, child in toboggan, reaches its maximum speed at the bottom of a hill and then glides to a stop in 21 meters along a horizontal surface. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the snow and the toboggan is 0.11. Draw a free body diagram of the toboggan on the horizontal surface. Determine the magnitude of the kinetic friction. Calculate the work done by the kinetic friction. So here we're combining our ideas of kinetic friction from the previous unit. Uh, and the idea of work to, to come up with an example, uh, to come up with a solution to this problem. So if we draw a free body diagram here, um, the only force after the toboggan reaches the bottom of the hill, which gravity was accelerating it down the hill, uh, once it hits the bottom of the hill, the only force acting on it again is the force of friction. So the only thing I'm gonna draw here is a force backwards, we're going to say that the motion, the displacement is in this, this direction here. Okay. And we know that that displacement is 21 meters. So we want to draw a free body diagram of the toboggan. We just did that. Then we want to determine the magnitude of kinetic friction. So let's find the magnitude of kinetic friction. Uh, I'm actually going to drop the vector symbol here again. Just let's, they saw, they talked about the magnitude. So we'll just write FF. And FF is mu FN. We know that FN from the previous unit uh, is uh, found by understanding that all the forces in the vertical direction are going to add up to zero because there's no, um, there's no acceleration in the vertical direction. That means FN is just MAG. So just to talk about the dot symbol being used here uh, for multiplication, there's no problem with that. We can still use dots for multiplication. It's just when the dots are between two vectors that you have to understand that it means a different type of multiplication, okay? Um, so our mu here is 0.11. Our mass is, I believe it was 85, yeah, 85 kilograms. Our acceleration of gravity is 9.8. With the force of friction, you do not put the negative sign, even though we are using um, magnitudes here anyway. So let's pull up the calculator. We've got 0.11 times 85 times 9.8. And that gives 91.63 Newtons which we could round off uh, for our um, significant digits. So I'm just gonna forget about that for now. And then the last thing is calculate the work done by the kinetic friction. So work is equal to F dot D, two vectors multiplying. We know that the force of friction is this way. We know that the displacement is this way. We're gonna find the component of force that's pointing towards the direction well. The angle here is 180 degrees, okay? So we're gonna do force of friction, which is the force that's pointing in the opposite direction, times the cosine of 180 degrees, times the displacement. So our force of friction is 91.63, 
times cosine of 180, which we know is negative 1. If you don't believe me, do it on a calculator. Uh, times the displacement, which I think was 21 meters. Yeah. So pulling up our calculator here, 91.63 times 21 times negative 1. Which is just going to make the answer negative. So we're getting, I completely forgot what that number was, 1924, 23, negative joules. And again, we could round this final answer off with significant digits. So, so far in summary, uh, when you're calculating the work, and remember that energy is the capacity to do work, so we kind of have to understand what work is before we can understand what energy is. Um, work is equal to the force times displacement, and both of those are vectors. And when you have two vectors multiplying, you have to either use something called the dot product, which is what we're using here, or the cross product, which I'm gonna let your uh, calculus teacher teach you if you ever take calculus. Actually, there's one more thing that we should probably discuss to complete this lesson. Um, can you have zero work? Are there situations in which um, object, an object experiences a force or a displacement or both, yet no work is done? Um, well, if you think about, uh, I said a while ago that positive work is anything between zero and 90 degrees, but what happens at exactly 90 degrees? Well, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So if you have an angle between your force and your displacement of 90 degrees, you're going to have um, zero work being done. And that would be the example down here for example three. So if you look at this skater holding up uh, their partner, um, the force exerted by the skater is perpendicular, but the movement is horizontal. So if you have a force that's upwards and a horizontal motion, the angle between the two of them is zero. Sorry, is 90. When you have an angle of 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 is zero. This person is doing no physical work on their partner. Now, they might be doing biological work. The muscles are straining. Um, there's some biological stuff going on in here, but uh, physics-wise, no work is being done on here. So if you're standing there with a weight in your hand uh, and just holding it and you're not moving it, you have done no work uh, on that object um, because the force is, even if you're walking with it, the force is upwards, you're walking forwards, those two things are perpendicular to each other. As soon as you have a perpendicular force and displacement, you have zero work being done. Now, there's also cases where you can be exerting a force, but there's no motion, right? If you're pushing on a wall or you're pushing on a stuck car, again, you're gonna get tired. There's biological work being done, but physics wise, no work is being done on that wall because, or the stuck car because they're not moving. There's no displacement. If there is a displacement, but no force. So for instance, a puck on an air uh, hockey table, uh, then that would be another case where you would have no work. Uh, now the, hockey, the puck would have to have been hit by something, but as it's moving without being touched by anything, so no other forces on it, um, well, the only force would be upwards from the air blowing out of the hockey, uh, air hockey table. Um, but that doesn't count here technically because we're talking about um, still a horizontal and a perpendicular force. But um, yeah, so there are considerations here where you got to be careful. There might be zero work done. Okay. Actually, I got this example in a book and I'm not sure if example two makes any sense at this point. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> example one and example three for sure. Um, I'm trying to think of an example where there'd be no force but there'd still be a displacement. Um, anyway, maybe you can think of one. So that'll be it for the lesson. Um, there'll probably be some homework questions assigned so please take a look at uh, any messages you get from the Google Classroom.